Ahoy! Welcome to the live The Medical Futurist YouTube channel. This is Dr. Bartolomeshko, your medical futurist. And I'm very glad that I can have this live Q&A with you about a very exciting topic. What you can expect from artificial intelligence going into 2023. As usual, I will focus on the, the medical, the uh, healthcare aspects, characteristics of the impact of this amazing technology. And I will try to answer as many questions as I can. Plus, also, I've been preparing a few interesting things for you to go through and discuss. Uh, I plan to have a few AI-based exercises with you too. So we have a lot of things to do in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. So let's jump right into it. But the, the one thing you could help me with right now is if you could share in the chat just a number between 1 and 10, how much do you think you know about artificial intelligence. One would mean you know nothing, essentially, and 10 would mean you even code AI yourself. So with just one number, you could give me a picture about, you know, what I can expect from the conversation uh, with you today, and it would help me a lot. Four, the first number is coming in. All right, two, okay. You will have plenty of examples to go through then. Jorge, nice to meet you again on the chat, seven. So again, between one and 10, how much do you know about AI? One meaning nothing, 10 meaning I know everything out there there is to know about this exciting technology. Then six, so we have four, two, seven, six. All right, three, it gives me some, some room to discuss a few things. Hi, Jorge, absolutely. Welcome to the live Q&A as usual. In the meantime, for those that don't know me or the medical futurist, um, I'm a physician by training with a PhD in genomics, but I switched to futuristic studies more than a decade ago. So I've been working as a professional futurist and my job is to provide the context around AI and digital health, especially thinking about the near future of medicine and healthcare. I give keynotes, I write books, I work with governments and medical associations and patient groups, try to help them anticipate what might come next, what might come next. In that sense, I lead the Medical Futurist team, a team of 15 people, where we try to do the same on a range of social media channels. And at the Medical Futurist Institute, we do the same kind of job, but through peer-reviewed research. We publish papers and studies in high-level journals about the impact of digital health and AI on the near future of medicine and healthcare. So we have four, two, seven, six, three, six, four, seven, quite the mid-range. So I think it's, it's a good basic knowledge that we can work with here. And still, it seems that you are still curious people trying to learn some new things, new tricks uh, about AI. Hi, Luis Diego. Nice to meet you on the chat. First things first, the reason why I always have this Q&A session about AI at the end of the year is that every year we update this infographic. We I just shared in the chat with you. Here it is also on the link, a guide to artificial intelligence in healthcare. It's available on leanpub.com. There is a 60 day money back guarantee. So you simply, if you didn't like the book, you will get back to your money. This is the, the, the policy we've been having for many years with all the tens of thousands of eBooks we have sold already. In that eBook, we cover everything, the methods, the levels, the definition, the dangers, the advantages of artificial intelligence, all these while keeping medicine and healthcare in mind. So we have we have worked a lot on this book and um, I think over about nine or 10,000 people have purchased the book already. And again, we update it every single year. So please feel free to check it out. And I the, the plan I have for today is that I thought that I wouldn't go through the same things again and again. As the years go by, we, you, we know more and more about artificial intelligence, so I won't cover the basics anymore. We had live Q&As and many YouTube videos for that before. But what I would do today is that I would try to highlight a few trends, emerging trends, a few issues that I think will be quite interesting to watch going into 2023. And the first of this, I think, must be a special method called Generative Adversarial Networks, or GANs. We just actually published an article about that today. The reason why it's so important to, to have a you know, basic knowledge about how GANs work is that all these image generational networks and AI programs anyone can use at home, all these work by using GAN. And 
what GAN means essentially is that there is there are two algorithms. One algorithm, let's use this example, is trying to create fake Picasso paintings. And the other algorithm is trying to find out which painting is real and which one is a fake Picasso. And the better the painter can become at creating fake Picassos, of course, the better the, the other guy can become, the policeman can become to spot those fake Picassos. So by each of them doing their own uh, jobs, the end product is that they will, we will end up having better and better, more real life looking Picasso, fake Picasso paintings. And this is the, the kind of method that even the program called Mid Journey uses. I've, I covered that, I think the last time we had a live Q&A, but I thought that just for a you know, fun first few minutes, uh, we could try to create AI generated images. I'm sure there are some people in the chat who have never done this before. So what I would like to do is that I will show you how it works and then I will ask you to share your briefings with me. But there is a Discord channel here called Mid Journey. I can put in imagine and into the prompt section, I can write a textual brief about an image I would like the AI to create with me. For example, um, a futurist having a live conver conversation in a huge lecture hall with a lot of curious, good looking people. Why not? And uh, optimistically, in a few minutes, you will get something in return, right? Now you can see that my prompt is at 0% for now. Now we are at 12%. I hope that you can see. Yes, you can see it. Okay. Where is it? Here it is. Wow, it's going to be, no, not this one. This one is going to be a very weird image, 25%, maybe a few more seconds. But in the meantime, you could start thinking about what kind of briefs you would like me to, to prompt the AI with. So the AI will draw those pictures for you. I hope that you are writing in the chat already your textual briefings. <laughs> the future is, is going to have a very strange uh, physical characteristic, but let's wait until the image is done. It's 93%, maybe a few more seconds, and it will be at 100%. Actually, we can choose which picture looks the best. Out of the three, I love the four the most. Here it is. So I guess... That would be our picture, a uh, futurist talking to a lot of curious, good-looking people. Well, it's a, quite a strange uh, result we have here. But in the meantime, I want to check if you would like me to prompt the AI with any kind of textual briefings. Um, oh, Jorge, why am I using mid-journey? Because I think, in a way, we have to get accustomed to working with AI. And unless you, you started working with AI in your job, in your life, in any ways, in any capacities, you didn't have the chance to, to build um, an emotional, cultural relationship with that really amazing technology. So yes, I, I do believe that everyone sh should start using AI in one form. For example, I have a five-year-old daughter and we like to play quick draw. It's, uh, I think, quite the smart application from Google. Here is quick draw. And what we do is that the AI gives us things to, to, to draw. I'm very bad at drawing, but my daughter is very good at it. We try to draw it and the AI will try to recognize these, uh, these drawings. I think it, it does help create um, an emotional bond or just to better understand how we react to the things that AI can do. In the meantime, I'm checking if um, yeah, so if you have any briefings for me, journey, just let me know and I will include it in the Discord section. But there are some questions to answer first, so I will go through them. Melissa Morrissey has a question about whether will AI make humans redundant in healthcare? Well, Melissa, I do believe that all the repetitive and or database tasks uh, in healthcare should be automated. So if there are repetitive and or database tasks in one medical professional's job, then those tasks will be will become useless because doing them in an automated way makes much more sense. It's much, much more cost efficient, it's much more efficient, and it allows people 
to have real life conversations with other people, with patients, and do what they are the best at, care for patients. Mihail Chetan had a question about this, not this. When AI will become a tool for GPs? It's a hard question to ask because, you know, for what GPs? Worldwide or in a certain country? But I understand what you imply with the question. When would AI become a, like a common tool in, a, in, a, in the job, in the life of a medical, of a primary care physician? I think that uh, it will become, AI will become part of GP's job sooner than um, governments making it possible for them because patients will bring AI-based services to their primary care professionals. Like how, as a patient, I have been bringing data from AI-based services about my own health and disease management to my primary care professional. All right, one more question before I go into the next section. Uh, Ther Theresa Nyhauser has a question about limitation. What will limit AI adoption? Well, the biggest thing I think is a, is a sort of cultural transformation, the need for a cultural transformation. Many AI-based technologies are ready to be deployed, even more have been deployed already. I think regulations are getting closer to reality. But we, people working in, working for healthcare, we are just not ready for that. And I'm not even talking about patients. How hard it's going to be for the patient-doctor relationship to, to, to welcome a new member to the medical team, automation. So I think that's the thing that we should wor work on the most, the, the cultural part of, of welcoming a new member to the medical team. All right. Wow, what a good question to ask from Patrick Blomquist. Has there, any be, has there been any legal cases when AI is responsible for malpractice and what happened? I'm not aware of any, but I'm sure that the general assumption here is that if the if a medical professional used the AI service as the service was intended to be used and still makes a mistake, then is the legal responsibility of the medical professional. Um, no, I mean, if the physician makes a mistake, then it's his or her legal responsibility. If they make a bad decision because the AI came to a bad decision, even if it was used in the right way, then it would be the legal uh, responsibility of the company making the AI available. It's a very complicated thing uh, to discuss, but that's the assumption for now. Um, Jorge, AI will be, Jorge Cardona, AI will be a tool for GP when the GP's curriculum let them know about it. It's true, but I think they will have to, GPs will have to work with AI much sooner than the AI would become a part of their medical curriculums. I talked about it before that I've been teaching medical students about AI for many years. And when we checked, there are only a handful of courses worldwide doing that as part of the medical curriculum. Um, okay. Okay. Now, the second thing I wanted to show, oh, I, I just shared a link to the um, GANs in the chat so you can check it out if you want and this is the the article the second link i shared not so long ago on medicalfuturist.com about how you can get friendly with ai before it gets to the office and in that we ask mid journey to create images for us and i think it has been quite the experience finding out what the ai thinks about futuristic hospitals medical robots or, or physicians working with automation, especially artificial intelligence in the healthcare setting. And I think that that article helps um, summarize your thoughts about that. Maybe it will prompt you to start using or working with these applications to learn how to, what to feel about AI when you start working with them. One more trend we should talk about going into 2023 when it comes to AI is this, that there are some um, aspects of healthcare where AI, I think, has already become part of everyday care. There are, there are fields or um, therapeutical uh, areas where AI has penetrated the walls of regulations and adoption. And here are the th three fields about this. One is about vocal biomarkers. The second one is about detecting, um, for example, COVID and other infectious diseases based on cough analysis through the smartphone. And the third one is skin checking algorithms. And we describe 
why these examples represent uh, good examples about penetrating the walls of AI. And then we describe each with, uh, you know, good details. And we have actually articles about each of these. First, skin checking gaps, which is an excellent way for patients to take a photo of their skin lesions and allow AI to analyze the images. The reason why it's working so well is that this is how the, 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 even dermatologists, what they do is that they use dermatoscopes and they try to look at the skin lesions with as many details as possible. Today's smartphones can do the same. They have excellent cameras, so we can really take high quality photos. And then the AI can compare the images of your skin lesions to millions, if not billions of images in the skin databases. And this way it would, it would uh, provide an initial diagnosis or recommendation. And then the algorithm, the, uh, the decision could be reconfirmed by a dermatologist. It, it happened to me too. Uh, I had a skin lesion to be checked. The algorithm uh, confirmed that I should get checked, checked it out by a dermatologist. And then even a dermatologist at the, the skin checking app company um, reconfirmed the analysis. So it's very useful. The second one is about vocal biomarkers, uh, simply how AI could analyze our phone conversations and try to diagnose uh, medical conditions such as Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease. And th there are many studies now that in the last couple of years, there have been many studies coming out about that. And the third is about cough or breathing pattern analysis. So you cough into your smartphone and it tells you uh, what it thinks about what, what kind of diseases you might have. And if you think it's a bit far-fetched, uh, let me tell you about what my primary care physician told me about people coughing outside her office. She told me that the way, you know, they sit in line in a queue and they start coughing outside, but the way she heard, she hears those different types of coughs, she can tell basically what kind of conditions those patients would have by the time they enter her medical practice, her medical office, because different conditions have uh, different sound patterns. So human physicians have been doing that for decades, if not hundreds of years. So it makes sense to translate that knowledge into an algorithm. So it could do, do that for us by, ma by making us the point of care, the general goal of the digital health revolution. That was the second trend um, about what we have to know about AI going into 2023. The third thing is around deep fakes. I'm sure you have come across many uh, deep fake videos, really amazingly uh, designed algorithms can do these deep fake videos that I think at some point will make uh, making movies not obsolete, but it will change the industry forever. Because now, you know, the movie companies try to get the best actors, the best actresses for a role. But what if we could just use deep fake algorithms to put the best actresses and actors into any kind of roles in these movies. And um, that's why we, the reason why we have to deal with deep fake in the healthcare setting is that you have to be able to spot if your remote care physician is an AI. That's an issue we, we came up with um, earlier this year. And I think as the gap between, so basically there is a, there is a mathematical gap between how many physicians we can train and how many patients need medical attention. We cannot train as many physicians as we need and 5 million healthcare workers are already missing. That's one part of this equation. The second part is that there's a growing number of patients requiring medical help, not because we are getting sicker, but because healthcare is getting better at diagnosing conditions. Plus about one and a half billion people have never had access to healthcare. So that mathematical gap between how many physicians we have and how many patients require medical help will just uh, get, keep growing simply for these two, three reasons. So we need a technological solution to fill that gap. And we should get accustomed to the idea that it's a luxury to be able to meet a healthcare professional with any kind of health issues to handle, even minor ones. So I think at some point, and we can call it a prediction, at some point you will come across a remote care physician who is not a physician at all but uh, a deep fake algorithm trying to mimic what a physician would look like on video. That's why it would make sense to learn how to spot if your remote care physician is an AI. So essentially how to spot deep fakes. And I really want to 
ask you first before diving into the details. Do you know, like you start having a remote care consultation with a physician, you start thinking that this physician might be a deep fake video. What would be your trick to try to find out whether it's a deep fake algorithm or a real physician? What would you do? In the meantime, Ismail, thank you for sharing that. In, in our company, we are using algorithms to predict future hospitalizations. We have an 85% margin of predictions in certain pathologies. Why? It's, it's amazing. Jorge, if you mean why don't I write a book about digital therapeutics? Because we haven't done it yet. But the medical, the medical futurist, we, we will work on that, I think, early 2023. So what would be your way of trying to find out if it's a deep fake video or uh, just you're talking to a real physician through video chat. Any ideas, suggestions here? I know it's quite a special challenge to handle, but let's try something. You would, would you ask a specific question to the deep fake algorithm to find out whether it's real or not? Anyone having any ideas about this? And then of course I will reveal the right method for doing that. Asking Turing machine questions. Well, uh, if it's a real physician, it, he or she will take it as a, you know, offensive thing to do, an offensive act from your side. There is a much, actually, plus, what is the Turing kind of question you would ask? It's not easy to choose one that would help you decide whether it's a deep fake algorithm or a real physician. Captcha? Would you ask the, the, the physician to do a CAPTCHA for you? Okay. Perhaps doing some unusual questions. Again, it's really hard to choose one that would help you do that. And what if the algorithm is, is cognitively very advanced? It will answer your questions really easily. Once I had a conversation with a chatbot, a Ukrainian chatbot many years ago, and it was called Eugen, and I thought I would trick it. And I asked Eugene, uh, what if Jane has five apples and Joe has five more apples? How many apples would they have together? And the chatbot told me, do you really want to talk about apples? You can even believe that it's a real person. It's, it's a real person saying that. Using some anti-fake algorithm. Well, Horga, if patients would have anti-fake algorithms, uh, that's not the future we are anticipating. San David, checking the empathy level of remote physicians. I think if you use that method, many physicians today working as real life human physicians would fail the test simply because they have to do administration in 60% of their time. So they won't have a chance to provide and show real levels of empathy. There is a much more technological solution for that actually. And if you don't have any more suggestions, um, then I will tell you what to do. You have to ask the deep fake algorithm to look at the side. And if the, if the video face has to look at one of the sides, it's a very hard task to handle for a deep fake algorithm. So if you want to check or spot if your remote care physician is an AI, that's what you have to do. And we discussed it because it, it comes with it trust issues. Um, and you can train yourself with chatbots. You can spot deep fake like unnatural eye movements or unnatural facial expressions, blurring, some misalignment, not just on the regular Zoom calls you might have, but even in those videos. So yeah, it, it makes sense to, to try to spot um, if your remote care physician is an AI or not. Here is the link as usual to the article we wrote about it. And there are a few more, you, you send me uh, on the even bright website, some really amazing questions like David Litoff had these two questions. One was about where will, where will we see the biggest impact, impact of AI at first? If it's at first, it's a very specific question that I would say drug design and drug repurposing. Okay. I stop at drug design simply. The whole clinical trial process of uh, spending billions of dollars in a decades uh, in long on a decades long process, starting with one potential drug target, a molecule that could later become a product, and you spend so much money and so much time trying to find out if it's a good candidate or not, 
And the way AI changes it into uh, starting with millions of potential drug targets, drug molecules, and maybe running in silico clinical trials, so testing those drugs on billions of real looking patient models in, in days or, or hours that will change the industry. So I think it's, it's going to be drug design. And will AI increase or decrease the cost of healthcare? Um, I think the co it will increase the cost, but also increase cost efficiency. So how do you make a decision about this? If it, it costs you more today to implement an AI-based solution, but from now on, hundreds and then thousands and then tens of thousands of patients won't be hospitalized for a mistake nobody made. They were prescribed the right medication based on protocols and studies. They took the medications as it was prescribed for them, but they their molecular genetic makeup is so different that uh, they it, it led to major side effects and they were hospitalized. What if we could avoid those many patients being hospitalized, leaving from work, just think about all the economical implications and the health implications, just making the lives of patients better, so it costs more now, but it's more cost effective on the long term. What is your decision about this? Let's see one more. Um, Suba Ramia has a question about uh, this. Are there proven AI based machine learned drug discovery? If so, what are the drugs and how are they discovered? I think DeepMind has a recent yeah, they, it uh, was, here is the, let me share the link with you and also the article that, that the um, Alphabet's DeepMind company and its algorithm called AlphaFold could identify like the structure of 200 million proteins and just, you know, even imagining the implications of that and how many drug targets it could lead to is simply mind blowing. Yet, to answer the question, I don't think it has been shown in a, you know, peer reviewed study that such a protein database has led to the creation of such a protein database has led to a drug on the market. I think we are just too early in that process to be able to, to come up with such studies. Uh, okay. Just checking the chat for a few seconds. And then the next topic I wanted to share with you going into 2023 is about still training healthcare professionals. And even though we cannot train as many as we need, well, we can try. And maybe the, the reason why, the challenge why we cannot train as many as we need is that we keep on sticking to a traditional method of people teaching people how to become good doctors. And it takes so many years, five or six years for basic education, and then three, four, five, six more years to become a specialist. And you still don't have enough experience, even though you have been training yourself for more than a decade. So what if you could use AI tutors to train enough medical professionals? And the reason why we discussed it, this uh, topic on medicalfutures.com is that uh, there was um, a study showing an algorithm that could help medical, medical students not just better prepare for exams by uh, taking part in their preparation process, but maybe even trying to find out what could be the best time to take the exam during their learning process. Just imagine that, you know, normally what students do is that we take exams when there is an exam peri period. But what if I, I'm at, a, I'm at the, the highest level of knowledge at a different time point, but there are, there, is, there are no exams on that day? What if we could make it happen? Uh, we could release the burden on educators a little bit. We could help train students even better. And I think it's at some point, it's gonna be inevitable to, to use AI in training future medical professionals. So it makes sense to prepare for that. I also shared the link with you in the chat. Siri Lyric, it's a good point you're making. We've heard this kind of hype before the Human Genome Project 30 years ago. Let's think about that if it, if it was the same kind of hype. I remember that because at that time I was a medical, no, I was just about to go to medical school to become a geneticist uh, researcher. And I was very pumped up about the Human Genome Project. And I think our expectations were overhyped. 
I don't think that the Human Genome Project uh, is something that could be compared to artificial intelligence, not just because of the the different amplitude of changes that these technologies uh, come with, but also because the Human Genome Project was completed. And that time, so 20 something years ago, it cost about $3 billion, billion to get one genome sequence, and now it's under $200. From If, if the expectations would have been about, uh, well, let's bring the cost of genome sequencing down to hundreds. We could say that in two decades, researchers have managed to do that. But the expectations were about changing healthcare forever, that because having a genome sequenced, everyone would know everything about their health and disease, especially about predictions and risk, score, risk scores. But we don't, still don't. I think the expectations were not healthy. That's why we have to deal with artificial intelligence today, even before it's really a part of your life, it's really a part of everyday medicine and healthcare, to, um, to control expectations, to drive hype down, to keep on sticking to the evidence-based idea of imp implementing AI into healthcare. That's why we have to um, deal with these expectations, so we know what we can work with in the next couple of years, so AI will not redesign healthcare, AI will not shape everything we know about medicine, but AI gradually will dive into the healthcare process. And there are certain areas, like the ones I've been mentioning before, drug design, drug repurposing, vocal biomarkers, skin checking algorithms, and all these, but AI will have a significant role. And we can start working with those around cultural, emotional issues about regulations, and then step by step, we can get to even higher, even more, more exciting things. Jorge had a question. Don't you think to use AI like a tutor, the learning medicine paradigm must change? Yeah, sure. Um, the, the, the idea must change that we just have to share lexical knowledge with students and they will become good physicians. That's a paradigm that's, that's simply wrong. Um, it's based on the assumption that we just have to put people into the ivory tower of medicine, keep them there for long enough while pushing them to learn as much as it's humanly possible. And that will lead to having good medical professionals. But what if we could use virtual reality-based simulation, simulations to allow medical students to, to feel in empathy by giving them the patient perspective, literally in a VR experience? What if we could use AI to constantly um, iterate the, and fine tune the, 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 the knowledge and the skills of those students to really meet the expectations of their courses. I think these advanced technologies have a role in, in medical education and the paradigm shift must come again from a cultural perspective. Physicians understanding that they cannot know everything. They cannot know the answer to every question. And it's fine to say, I don't know. And it's even finer to reach out to technologies when they don't know the answer to patients' questions or to a, the, the, the solution for a medical issue. What do you mean, I-E-Y? Wouldn't those bad expectation results put one in a bad mood for the rest of his or her lifetime? Well, please uh, elaborate what you, think by, what you think by that. In the meantime, let me show you one more trend or emerging trend that it, they, it makes sense to talk about going into 2023. It's about regulating logged and adaptive algorithms. The US Food and Drug Administration has been the one, the first regulatory body in the world to regulate logged algorithms, meaning that machine learning based algorithms, which, which will be the same, even though it uh, keeps on making decisions and automate decisions for medical professionals. But the real excitement comes when you start thinking about adaptive algorithms. You know, that's the real essence of machine learning, that you, you build an algorithm that will become better with every decision it makes. So regulating adaptive algorithms might be the, the holy grail of uh, digital health regulation after all. And I think 2023 could be the year when the FDA could start regulating adaptive algorithms. I think it's very exciting and these are very challenging times we are living through. But the, the time the regulatory bodies start regulating adaptive algorithms, well, I think that's going to be the real era of the art of medicine. 
because from that time, uh, physicians will be able to use algorithms that will just become part of the medical team. And I think it's it's incredibly exciting to have these as part of medicine. Let me share the link with you as well. All right. There's one more thing here. Uh, I thought that we would write an article just summarizing everything there is to know about AI. And we we published this, this article here about what has AI ever done for us, you know, from the... Uh, Life of Brian, Monty Python movie. We use that line here. And there are at least 50 things that AI has done for us based on studies, uh, peer-reviewed papers already. And we have links to all these real-life examples. So please feel free to, to go through them. And I think this is the one, this is the last trend I wanted to share with you. And there are a few more questions that you asked, such as, oh, I, it's a very special name. Sorry for saying that. I-E-Y. Learning about the genome sequence, for example, you learn you are 90% prone to the disease, won't be a burden for the patient to learn this and live with it. Yes, but they can do things to try to prevent it from happening, prevent it from getting worse, or um, predicting important clinical outcomes. So either way, knowing about the risk or not knowing about the risk, the risk is there. And I think knowing the risk and and receiving ways or methods of fighting against it sounds to me much better than just having the risk and have zero knowledge about it at all. Uh, I know it could be a burden emotionally, but we have to get used to it. Plus, it's not that people like me want to push this information onto everyone's tables at home, but I want those people like me, patients like me, who want to have this information to have a chance to access that information. <coughs> Sorry. That's why it wouldn't be a burden. Or if it's a burden, it's something you can get used to. When I had my first genetic test, of course I had, you know, anxiety about what kind of results it might find. But since then, I've had about seven or eight genetic tests. I had my genome sequenced. I had my microbiome sequenced. I had more than 10 genetic counseling sessions. And I think I, I've been learning how to manage my anxiety about that. So I, I, I learned how to deal with this emotional burden. And I'm very happy that I have knowledge about these risks and I have a chance to do something against them. Yeah, it's better to know. I know it, it's a burden, but you can learn how to manage that burden. Absolutely. Okay, a few more questions to go through. Oh, uh, Irim Yapar has a very smart question to ask. Do you envision there will be a big data consortium for patients' medical records data all over the world, open for developers? Well, maybe in a utopistic world, an ideal world, but it's not going to happen. It, it hasn't even happened during COVID-19. Uh, during a pandemic that has impacted everyone, some pharma companies started sharing data with each other, but it has not happened on an open access um, level. Therefore, I, I don't see that happening. I'm afraid individual patients will uh, have to rely on their own judgment about what kind of data they would like to share and with what kind of um, groups, databases, companies. You know what I think about the privacy challenge that comes with it, that uh, it's impossible to keep your privacy intact in the age of AI. But the real question we should ask ourselves is how much of my privacy I am willing to give up in exchange for a chance for a longer and healthier life. And as long as I'm the one making the decisions for myself, ethically, I should be fine. If it's a government or a health insurance or a pharma company doing that for me, then we have a different discussion. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's see if there are any other questions. Well, there are a few here. Um, what are the lesser known areas that AI could still yet have a big impact on? It's a very smart question to ask. And I want to show you uh, an article I, I wrote not so long ago about the, here it is. I also share it in the chat. Okay. And now I want to show you the article itself. 
So it's about artificial intelligence discovers unusual associations in medicine. I was very excited when I started learning about what kind of new things AI could uh, learn, like the association between specific brain waves and uh, antidepressant treatment outcomes. You know, you would not think about these things as a clinician or researcher, but AI started doing and making such connections between the dots in healthcare or identifying genetic conditions based on the profile photos of patients. It's it's really amazing what kind of things. Or uh, well, the one why I was excited about when I learned about it first is how it became possible to use AI to detect Alzheimer's disease from uh, phone conversations, you know, based on vocal biomarkers or uh, determine heart attack risk by doing retina scans. There are really amazing examples about all those, all these. And I think that's the part where uh, AI could still have an impact on things we have no knowledge about. Yeah. Yes, I just shared the link, uh, Jorge, of course. I just did that. All right. What will be the next big wave in AI? And when is it anticipated to hit healthcare? Well, it's a question I want to share with you all. How can we and should we prepare for it? The next big wave in AI, I think I would put my bet on uh, skin checking apps and vocal biomarkers. Actually, at the Medical Futurist, we not so long ago wrote about an application in, in my country, in Hungary, that started becoming part of the national healthcare system. And I think it's incredibly exciting to see an AI-based system becoming part of everyday healthcare and how it could help diagnose more patients with dermatological conditions and how we could this way allow them to prevent things from happening or catch diseases as early as possible. In that sense, I would again put my bet on skin checking gaps and vocal biomarkers. The first, those AI technologies that could literally penetrate the walls of the practical medicine and healthcare. When are those anticipated? I think these have been becoming uh, part of healthcare in certain countries. So if you live in Germany, or the US or Hungary, then these waves have hit healthcare already. If you live in other countries, maybe not so much. So it depends on which country's healthcare system you're talking about. And how can we prepare for it? Of course we should, is that uh, you can learn about the basics of AI. Of course it always helps. And I think I, I shared this one before, but I want to share it with you again, that we published in uh, NPJ Digital Medicine, uh, I think one of the highest level journals on digital health, uh, this paper not so long ago, a short guide for medical professionals in the era of AI. And it's not just for medical professionals, but in this article, we describe the absolute basics, the, a, a package of, of information and, and, and data, or maybe even definitions that everyone needs to know about AI. The definition, the levels, the methods, the advantages, and the risks. If you, if you know this package, I think you know enough. But the best way to anticipate it and to prepare for it is to work out again your emotional connection to AI. So the first time you start working with a smartphone, if you, have, if you didn't have smartphones before and you start having a, star, a smartphone, you build a connection with it. Whether you take it to your bedroom is, is one aspect of it. Whether you use it all the time or just for important things, whether you only play games on it or not, all these things matter. And you sort of build, I'm just looking at my phone, <laughs> you build a connection with your smartphone. The same thing happens with other advanced technologies, including artificial intelligence. So if you start working with or just playing around with mid journey to create AI based AI generated images, if you start playing with the um, quick draw to see how AI could de determine what kind of things you are drawing for it, all these things help you form your connections to this advanced technology. And I think forming that connection and understanding your way of forming these connections matters more than how much technical knowledge you have about artificial intelligence. All right. All right. It seems we went across all the major questions you had. And um, I shared all the links and I'm very grateful for you all for being here with me today. 
uh, talking about what to anticipate about AI going into 2023. As usual, this live Q&A stream will be uploaded a few minutes after the session ends on our YouTube channel. Many thanks to those who joined us on the YouTube channel, so they support us to be able to be able to provide a range of free content across many channels. Uh, you can also support us and the Medical Futurist team on patreon.com slash the Medical Futurist. Thank you so for those like 160 people um, helping us, supporting us, so we can again create free content for everyone, for the 1 million followers the Medical Futurist has across a range of channels. On our YouTube channel, we will keep on coming up with so many interesting videos in the next couple of days, so please uh, subscribe if you haven't subscribed already, so you won't miss anything that we publish there. Um, I will have the next Q&A live session in two weeks with um, Alvaro Goyanes from FabRx, I think the most exciting company out there that can print out medications with a 3D printer. Yes, we will talk about 3D printed drugs and I will bring you the industry's most well-known expert. Uh, in the meantime, when is your new book? Is being published. We will publish an update. Uh, we just published the ebook, The Future of Hospitals on LeanPub, a uh, few weeks ago. And you can find all the ebooks we have published here on leanpub.com. Let me share the link with you. Plus, we will publish an update to the ebook we have about the future of pharma in about one and a half weeks. And we will keep on coming up with new ones as usual quite often. So thank you so much for being with me today. Please check out medicalfuturist.com for all the analysis and social media news we publish every single day. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done it already. Thank you again and have an excellent day.